Promethean, our sponsor, is a global leader in education technology. Promethean develops effective classroom tools such as the Active Panel the, and award-winning teaching software, Active Inspire, that makes learning fun and engaging and lesson preparation and delivery much easier for today's busy teacher. Promethean works closely with ministries of education and educational institutions in the region, that, that is the Middle East and beyond, to positively influence the way in which students learn and improve the quality of education by transforming classrooms into collaborative environments, promoting engagement and energizing students throughout the learning process. So we want to say a massive thank you to our sponsors this afternoon, Promethean. At this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. John Kolick. He is the head of international education strategy for Promethean, a world leader in interactive classroom technology. Dr. Kolick is a graduate of Sussex University in England. He lectured in English language and literature, as well as philosophy for 10 years in Japan working in the prestigious literature faculty of the Waseda University in Tokyo, where he designed and implemented the department's first e-learning system. In his role at Promethean, he works closely with ministries of education to develop solutions and programs to meet the needs of the 21st century education systems worldwide. He is an internationally renowned speaker and expert on the educational and social impact of innovative technology. He is the author of several books and articles on literature, media, and learning, ICT and learning. His specific interests include personal learning strategies, neuroscience, which he'll be touching on today, technology and futurology. So without further ado, let me welcome Dr. John Kolick. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Um, let me see if I can first of all share my screen. Uh, a, a welcome to everybody. It's great to see so many people from so many different parts of the world. Just let me share my screen. And there we go. All right. So you can see that. Is that OK? Lisa, can you just check to make sure that that's okay, coming out OK? All is well. Perfect. OK. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Don Colick. Uh, as, as Lisa said, I'm head of international education strategy. Over the next um, 30, 40 minutes thereabouts, I'm going to talk about research and the classroom. Um, and I'm going to talk about three things. First thing I want to talk about is some of the issues that happen when academic research is then communicated down to or not communicated down to the classroom and the impact of research on the classroom and some of the some of the questions that arise um, then i'm going to talk a little bit about um, the what possible ways there are to implement research in school in the classroom finishing by talking about the principles of what we call action research i'm sure that many of you will already have heard of action research but i want to talk a little bit about action research um, and how it compares to and how in many ways it's more an, a dynamic and valuable process than perhaps trying to implement some abstract academic research into teaching and learning so to begin with, what I wanna talk about is a topic that's particularly dear to my heart, which is neuroscience. Uh, neuroscience has had a huge impact, neuroscience research has had a huge impact on teaching and learning for many decades now. Um, but it has also given rise to uh, this concept of um, neuromyths. Now, the term neuromyth is something that first appeared in a report that was created by the OECD um, about 12 years ago, when people were, be were beginning to appreciate and understand the impact that some of the latest developments in neuroscience were likely to have on, on classroom practice. A neuromyth is defined as a belief or an understanding about how the brain works that is fundamentally incorrect but which has persisted. And what I want to go through is I want to go through some of these neuromyths and try and explain a little bit about why 
even though they are no longer regarded as true, why they persist in education. And by understanding the mechanisms that are causing this confusion, I'm hoping it will, I can equip you with some kind of tools or, or analytical ideas that will help you to spot in the future what seems valid against what perhaps is not invalid. So let's have a look at some of these neuro myths. Uh, this is one of the most, oh, probably one of the oldest, certainly one of the most persistent. The idea we only use 10% of our brains. Um, you hear this all the time. It's very common. The idea that we only use 10% and that 90% of our brain is asleep. It's dormant. And if only we could find the right technique, then we would unleash that 90% and we would all become geniuses. Um, it's difficult to try and pinpoint where this comes from. Uh, it's quotation that has been attributed to, for example, Henry T. Ford back in about 1900. It's also a, one possible reason why this, uh, this became a, a myth is that uh, doctors and scientists working in the very early stages of uh, neuroscience and psychology around about the beginning of the end of the Victorian era, end of the 19th century, basically said, you know, our knowledge is so limited, we only understand what 10% of the brain does. We've no idea what the 90% does. We've no idea. And that then became twisted into we only use 10%. It's a myth. The human brain is incredibly efficient. It, we use all of our brain all of the time uh, because the brain is designed to for minimum energy consumption, maximum efficiency. But it's a very persistent, a very persistent myth. Uh, this is one of my favorites. Cognition deteriorates with age. Basically, when we get to our late teens, our early 20s, we are at the height of our mental powers. And from then on, it's a slow, steady, slow, steady deterioration into stupidity. Um, every time you sneeze, a million brain cells die. Uh, it's a fairly hopeless situation. This doesn't really have any roots in any actual scientific research. It's more of a kind of an urban myth, an urban legend. Again, the latest neuroscience shows that this is incorrect, that the human, uh, that the human brain barring illness, will continue to thrive and develop and grow and learn throughout the entire life of the individual. So there's hope even for people like myself. Um, it, we, the way we learn changes, but we still can continue to grow and develop. This is a very famous one. I mean, I go to, I've been now, I've been going to education conferences now for probably about 20 years. And everyone I go to, I will, you know, you listen to presentations and somebody at some point will start to talk about left brain logical, right brain creativity, unleashing your create, creative right brain. Um, again, this theory is that the left brain handles numbers, logic, words, language, and the right brain is kind of creative and involved with things like art and music and innovation and dreaming. Um, this stems from some rather crude, uh, crude research slash medical experimentation that was done uh, in around about the 60s, whereby uh, in cases where people were suffering from severe epilepsy, uh, the experimental technique was done whereby the connecting tissue between the left and the right brain was severed. Um, it seemed to have some beneficial effect on the, on the epilepsy. epilepsy. Um, and it also created a whole range of other quite unusual side effects that led to this left brain, right brain theory. Um, there's also a slight amount of, of kind of value judgment here. The idea that, you know, modern societies, corporate society, it's all boring, it's all gray, it's all numbers, it's all left brain. We need to unleash our creative side and give that value, which is not necessarily a bad thing. However, it's not true from a scientific point of view. Yes, different parts of the brain do different things, um, but in a far more complex and interconnected way than this somewhat simplistic model. Now, it's worth at this point trying to understand what the origin of a lot of these, what I call hidden genius theories, where they come from. Certainly in the 60s and the 70s, there was this very, very persuasive 
idea that we all all had this hidden power inside our mind and that if we could only find the correct methodology we would kind of transcend humanity would transcend into the next level it's a narrative that has its origin perhaps on the west coast of the US, uh, the hippie movement, the counterculture movement around High Ashbury and Los Angeles and California. Um, the idea that if only we could embrace the right um, exotic mysticism, if only we took the right drugs, if only we did loads of mind mapping, we'd become fantastic geniuses. So this is kind of the historical and I think the social origin of a lot of these theories. Then you get later theories like this, Fish oil improves cognition, the idea of you take certain supplements. Again, this was incredibly, uh, this got, gained a lot of traction about probably about 10, 15 years ago. The idea that if you ate oily fish or you ate fish oil, it was somehow improved cognition. And of course, a lot of companies got very excited about this because they could sell lots of fish oil to parents who wanted to make sure their kids did well in exams. Um, again, it was refuted, but you still you still come across people, you know, in the shops, you can still come across um, boxes of fish oil or bottles of fish oil selling themselves as education, intelligence enhancing supplements. This all brings me on to um, perhaps one of the most controversial of these neuromyths. And I want to talk about this in a little bit of detail. I get into argue, often get into arguments about this again at conferences. I attend conferences and you hear this all the time. And that's Gardner's learning styles. Now, I'm sure that most of you are familiar with the theory of learning styles. Gar Howard Gardner in the 1980s proposed that different people learn in different ways. So you will have visual learners who respond to images. You will have auditory learners who respond to sound and words and music. You will have kinesthetic learners who respond and learn best by physical movement. Um, again, it was refuted by the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s. There was, and, and I'm, gonna walk, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the refutation process in a, in a minute. Um, basically, yes, the brain uses all of your senses all of the time for cognitive input. Uh, there is a hierarchy of senses, and it tends to go vision first, then sound, then smell, because those are the top three senses or inputs that are going to guarantee that you survive. Uh, you will see a predator before you hear a predator, before you smell a predator. Um, the idea that people have discrete approaches to learning is a myth. The one benefit of this is that when it became popular, it did open up education to experimenting more with multimedia, with different forms of presentation, which was not a bad thing. However, what this did, it would greatly increase teachers' workload for a start in lesson preparation. Secondly, one effect that it had was that children themselves started, and teachers also did it, but students in particular, began to pigeonhole themselves, say, no, I'm a visual learner. I'm an auditory learner. Sorry, miss, um, I'm not going to listen to what you say. I need you to give me a picture. Now, this is controversial because this is still a very powerful, commonly and widely accepted theory of education. But I want to step you through the kind of the, the research and refutation process um, to kind of explain how this happens and why we do get this disconnect between research and classroom practice. So 1983, Howard Gardner comes up with frames of mind, the theory of multiple intelligences. 1994, 11 years later, another researcher, Sternberg, says no evidence. There is no evidence to support this. Interestingly enough, in the year 2000, Howard Gardner himself says there is little evidence. There is little evidence for this. Um, 2004, Sternberg and Grigorenko do a meta-analysis of all the studies and say there's no, sorry, no validating study. 2009, the Association for Psychological Science, there's no adequate evidence. 2015, Cuevas, there's no adequate evidence. So why? 
why does the theory of multiple intelligences and a lot of these other theories, why do they persist even long after they have actually, the theories have been refuted and proved wrong? So I'm going to talk a little bit, a little bit about how this process works. I'm going to give you a, I'll tell you a little story. And I'm going to tell you a little story about this genius brain scientist called Dr. John. And Dr. John, what Dr. John does as a scientist, he comes up with a brilliant brain theory. And what do you do when you, as a scientist, when you do a theory, you do your experimentation and you publish your results. So he does his experiment. He writes a paper. That paper is then sent to an academic journal. The academic journal then sent it out to peer review. Um, half a dozen of his contemporaries, they say, yeah, OK, yeah, this looks this looks interesting. His methodology looks OK. Let's publish it. It is then published. By the way, that's how research is run. Experimentation, publishing, uh, sorry, paper, peer review, publication. Research is not Googling stuff on the Internet, despite what the trend seems to be worldwide at the moment. But that's how proper research works. Now what happens is that all over the world, scientists working in the same field get Dr. John's article in the journal and they say, right, we're going to test this. First of all, we're going to test his method. Is his method robust? Is it a proper experiment? And secondly, we're going to run the same experiment, but with a much, 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 much bigger sample. And then we're going to see if our results match his results. If our results match his results, then it's got a valid theory. Now, this can take years. This can take years. After 10 years, the conclusions come back. Da -da, poor Dr. John. His theory has been refuted. The method was flawed. The sample was too small. The conclusions he drew were illogical. That's refutation. And that's an essential part of the scientific process. But what's been happening what has been happening at the same time? Um, Dr. John and his contemporaries have been doing this academic research in the world of academia. And what's been happening in the rest of the world? Well, this was Dr. John's fantastic theory in 1968. He proposed that rats fed with lard seemed to be able to navigate mazes much quicker. So lard seemed to have an impact on their cognitive ability. He published his article. And then what happened was this was picked up. This was picked up by the British Lard Marketing Board. And the British Lard Marketing Board, they are a industry body that represents all the companies that sell this stuff for people to eat. And they think, oh, great. We can use this to sell more. And so they start a marketing campaign. They, they invest a lot of money, a lot of time in running a marketing campaign. Clever babies eat lard. Through to 1975, Give your kids lard and they will do better at school. Great stuff. And then as we already seen in 1976, all of Dr. John's contemporaries said, now, nah, sorry, further investigated, investigation showed absolutely no link between lard and intelligence whatsoever. What does the British Lard Marketing Board do? Do they say, oh, sorry, we made a mistake? No, of course they don't because they want to sell lard. So they just keep going. They either don't see the refutation or they ignore it. 1996, pass exams with smart lard. And by the time it gets to the 21st century, you've got YouTube influencers, you've got celebrities, you've got all of these people, vloggers, etc., continuing to promote something that was refuted 20 years before, over 20 years before. This happens all the time. And this is why, for example, left brain, right theory, Gardner's theory of intelligences, fish oil, et cetera. That's, this is why the, they persist in the classroom and in the public imagination, even though the refutation has occurred up in academia. What tends to happen, and we see this all the time, is the great new theory, which is cool and exciting, that makes good copy. It's interesting. Whereas the refutation that says, no, sorry, that was wrong, that's just not as persuasive or interesting as the original theory. And so that tends to get lost. The waters also get muddied by the popular press. 
um because they will often seize you know they want to sell newspapers they want to get the, get the public excited and interested and reading their stuff so they will often even pick up um supposed theories that are not theories at all and then they will promote them as being some kind of you know revelation uh, one of the worst examples is this article from the Daily Mail, which is a British newspaper, which I recommend you don't read. Um, but it said how you, you Facebook could raise your risk of cancer. Now, look at the language they're using. Facebook could raise your risk of cancer. And then in the first paragraph, Facebook could raise your risk of serious health problems by reducing the levels of face to face contact. A doctor claims all that means is that somebody said yeah hmm, facebook might have bad effect health wise over the long term and this has been seized on by a newspaper with an agenda to push and you get this all the time again eating fish make you smarter that was big news it was big news it was exciting it was interesting interestingly enough they did publish the refutation uh, and that's very unusual but other examples are things like blue light is bad for you if you stare at blue light it's bad for your brain um, again, it's all exaggeration. It's all taking simple throwaway statements and turning them into big stories. This is why we have to be so careful. Um, then also what you get, and this is further muddying the waters, and it's, again, things to look out for. Once you're aware of how these techniques work, then you can start to spot what is valid and what is invalid. Uh, this is a trend that started in the 60s and the 70s, where you got the phenomenon of the corporate scientist. So you have the company that's trying to sell something, claims that it has its own research team. Uh, it's particularly prevalent in pet food, shampoo, cosmetics, and sadly, education technology and education methodology. Our scientists have discovered that Thargalon B, registered trademark, plays an essential role in learning. And guess what? Our products contain far more Thargalon B than any other leading brand. And the reason for that is that nobody else on the planet has even heard of Thargalon B because it's a concept that was just invented by marketing. But this is where it starts to get a little bit, what's the word? <sighs> It's unfortunate to be polite because what it's now doing is it's employing the rhetoric and the symbolism and the imagery of education research in order to kind of, I hate to say, mislead people. And I'm going to give you an example of perhaps one of the uh, one of the most unfortunate examples of this in recent years. Um, I'm not going to mention any names, uh, but this is a perfect example of how pseudo, what we call pseudoscience or false science, adopts the rhetoric of education research. But when you actually look at it, it's actually quite manipulative. Um, quite, oh, over the uh, maybe about ten years ago, maybe yeah, about ten years ago, I think it was. There was a particular organisation that was going around promoting a method of kinesthetic calisthenic exercises, claiming that these exercises boosted brain function and cognition. Um, so for example, they'd have things like the Energizer. If you shake your head backwards and forwards, it pushes the blood to the front of your head and improves cognition. Uh, they have these things, hookups, which I believe that you put, you cross your arms and you put your thumbs on your collarbone. And this is how they would explain it. Pay careful attention to the language. Hookups shift electrical energy from the survival centers in the hindbrain to the reasoning centers in the midbrain and the neocortex, thus activating hemispheric integration. The tongue pressing into the roof of the mouth stimulates the limbic system for emotional processing in concert with more refined reasoning in the frontal lobes. It sounds so scientific. Um, when you actually scratch at the surface, what they're proposing is, is, is ridiculous getting over enthusiastic kids to do this in the classroom you're going to get you're probably going to get whiplash but not much else um, when it talks about pressing the tongue against the roof of the mouth to stimulate the brain there is literally a centimeter of solid bone between your tongue and your brain 
between the roof of your mouth and your brain. If you can stimulate your brain with your tongue, you need to stop whatever it is you're doing right now and go and seek urgent medical attention. But again, as I said, look at the language. The language sounds scientific. It's essentially what we call word salad. Even though it's using these scientific phrases, midbrain, neocortex, limbic system, hemisphere integration, it has absolutely no basis whatsoever in modern neuroscience. And the stinger is it costs $870 for six lessons. So this, um, this is why we have to be so careful. And this is why we have to kind of spot, be able to spot this kind of stuff against the real science. Um, I mentioned this term pseudoscience. Um, again, it's something that Carl Sagan spoke about. Uh, other scientists have also spoken about it. Pseudoscience is where you have a body of belief that claims to be scientific, but it has certain characteristics which make it very easy to identify. It sounds like science, we've just seen that. You get this lot of jargon and words that sound plausibly scientific. It tends to exaggerate results, which real science doesn't do, but it exaggerates results. Do, your, do our method and you will be a genius. And so it tends to be very confident as well, 100% confident, yes, this stuff always works, it really works. It confuses scientific statements with sales pitches, again, the Thargolon B syndrome. And it, this is important, it will dismiss refutation. So for example, if, and I'm just picking an example off the top of my head, if after doing mind mapping for a month, you're not a complete total genius, it's not because mind mapping is nothing more than a, a kind of an interesting alternate way of taking notes. It's because you're not doing it right. It's because you're not using enough colors or enough images. Um, and the other thing is, and this is again, as a global education community is something that we need to be careful about. They will move, it moves around to avoid detection. So typically you will have organizations springing up in Europe, in, in England, advertising this stuff eventually people will start to realize that what they're promoting is mm, it's not really genuine and so they tend to move somewhere else they will pop up in the far east for example or the middle east or, or other parts of the world so this is why it's very care you need to be able to spot these processes to recognize what as i said what is genuine and what is not genuine so that's, I've talked and spoken at length about um, scientific methodology and how difficult it is to then translate the results in an effective way into the classroom because you have that delay, uh, because you have that lag, a theory will appear, everybody will get excited about it. The theory will be then questioned or refuted, but that refutation doesn't make it down into public life. And that's why these things persist. What about running academic research in the classroom then? So if somebody comes up in a paper with a theory of education or there is a methodology, is it possible to run some kind of academic research in the classroom that imitates to a larger or greater extent the kind of thing you would do in a laboratory or a scientific institution? Again, this becomes problematic because, um, because of all the rigid, fairly rigid processes that a scientific research has to go through. If you are conducting a scientific experiment in a scientific way, then first of all, you need a robust, method a robust and documented methodology. That's fine, we can do that. You then need a sample size. If you're going to do research, you can't just do it with five kids. You've got to do it ideally with hundreds. And if you're talking about something that's likely to have been significant intervention, you're talking about possibly an entire year uh, across several schools. But you also need a control group. A valid scientific experiment takes, it will take a group, a group of children, and it will take another group of children that are exactly the same. And then what you do is you choose the variable you're going to change and you do it with one group. So that's your, the other group where nothing changes, that's your control group. 
and the group where you're changing one variable, that's your experimental group. You need a significant time period. You know, you can't just run something for a couple of weeks. You're going to need to run it over terms. You need to even perhaps run it over, over years. Um, and it also needs to be peer reviewed. You know, what I'm talking about are the fundamental building blocks of academic scientific experimentation. Now, if you're trying to do this at a school level, you're going to immediately bump into problems. Let's take an example. We're going to take two classes. We've, this, we've come across this new exciting technologically, technological widget, which claims to improve things in the classroom. So we're going to do some research in this. I'm going to have class A and class B. Class A is my control group. Again, these classes have to be exact, identical, identi as, I, as identical as you possibly can get it. Class A, I'm not going to do anything with it. Class B, they each child gets the widget. And then we will run this. And at the end, when they do their exams or their tests, we'll see how class B's results compared to class A. 24 hours after you start, the principal's telephone starts to ring. Why hasn't my child been given the widget like her friend in class B? Why are you using my child as a guinea pig in your research? You know, this is unfair. It's discriminatory. You, this happens immediately. You will get angry parents on the phone saying, why are you doing this? Why can't my kid have this as well? You know, this wonderful new thing. That's your first problem. The second problem is then when you're trying to co correlate results, because human beings are not laboratory mice. Human being, you cannot, this idea that you can have two groups, a control group and experimental group, and that you can isolate this single variable and see that as a determining factor in the results that a child will have, it, it's not possible. Children, students, people are subjected to a, a range of influences that are constant, powerful, and totally out of our control. So this child who's had the widget, this girl, she's had the widget, after a term, she's now doing an exam, sits down to do a test. But hang on a sec, maybe she skipped breakfast so she can't concentrate. Maybe she stayed up all night watching YouTube. Maybe her parents had a big argument this morning. Perhaps she's not feeling great. Perhaps her brother was arrested by the police last night. Maybe a pet cat died or a favorite pop group split up over half an, half, an, half an hour ago and she just got the text on the phone and she's distraught. All of these uncontrollable variables have a bigger impact on her results than education technology, than any intervention that you can run research on. So this is the issue with trying to replicate academic research down at a classroom level. In all honesty, it takes years to see the results of a theory playing out in education, because really you won't see results until pretty much a whole generation has passed through the system. The other thing is, is you're messing with real children's learning and there are too many uncontrollable factors. And a lot of this is simply down to the fact that academic research, academic, institutional, scientific research is very problematic trying to turn it into practical, useful stuff because academic research only suggests theories. Academic research, if it's proper research done in the, in the accepted way, will only ever say, this is probably true, not this is absolutely true. It encourages refutation. I will say, this is my theory, please prove me wrong. So suddenly the rest of the world or the rest of the scientific world in my field are trying to prove me wrong. And inevitably, it means it can be refuted at any time. And it takes a very, very long time. So what is the alternative? So in this last part, I'm going to talk about things that do work in terms of implementing and running some form of research program at a school or classroom level. First of all, case studies. The production of case studies rather than academic papers. Case studies are very valuable because they focus on practical effects of interventions in the classroom. 
more importantly, a case study is a teacher talking to a teacher. Ideally, case studies produced by teachers. You know, we tried this. This is what happened. Why don't you try it too? Now, teachers speak the language of teachers. Academic researchers sometimes speak a language that seems to bear no relationship to any other language spoken on earth. Whereas teachers are easy, you know, they will speak the language that everybody understands and what they have to offer will be experiential. It's based on experience, real lived experience in the classroom, and it's based on real life. It's not abstract. So this is where we come to the notion of action research, which is a methodology that you, we as teachers can use in our classroom that is doesn't try to prove anything, but instead is designed to improve practice and efficacy and also is immediately valuable within that or valuable within a very short time frame. So let's talk a little bit about what it is and how it works. This is the definition. Um, again, it's a little bit academic, I apologize, but action research is a form of self-reflective investigation by teachers to understand and improve their practice. So it focuses on understanding, actually stepping back and looking at how do I teach? Or in this particular circumstance, teaching this particular topic in this particular subject, what am I doing now? How am I doing this? And once I've understood and perhaps documented what I'm doing, can I think of a practical improvement? One single, not, you know, not the whole thing, but one single simple intervention that will allow me to change something that I do or the, something I deliver to make it better to make it more innovative? How can I introduce a single piece of innovation? Um, and again, this is a quotation to do action research is to plan, act, observe and reflect more carefully, more systematically and more rigorously than we normally do. Because when you're teaching, you're in a class, you're teaching, you go in into the class, you do your teaching, you come out again. And a lot of the time you're kind of just doing it. Whereas if you move into action research, then it's kind of slowing down a little bit as much as you can and observing yourself or observing each other in how the actual practice plays out in the classroom scenario. This is the action research uh, cycle and it's really simple. Review what you do now. Let's say for example, you're teaching mathematics and you wanna teach set theory and you're trying to get the kids to understand set theory in a, something they struggle with. So you're trying to get them to understand it a little bit easier, a little bit more effectively. So review what do you do now? How am I teaching set theory at the moment? In this class that's coming up, how am I actually tackling it? What am I doing? What am I saying to them? What tasks am I giving them? So what do I want to improve? I want to make it more interesting. I want to make the kit, I want to give another example, a more innovative example. Then you think of a way, and it's important to document this, document this down, writing stuff down. Again, it's a cognitive process. It introduces more thoughtfulness, more mindfulness, doing it, you know, even do it better, do it longhand. Think of a way, write it down and then try it out. So then you try it out and then you assess. Did it work? I tried that technique. What I did was I got the kids to stand up and pretend they were actually physically in sets. Um, and got them to interact as a way of demonstrating set theory. Did it work? Well, mm, this bit worked. That bit needs a bit more, you know, I need to work on that a bit more. So let's modify it and let's try it again. That is your action research cycle. Act, evaluate. Once you evaluated, modify what you did, do it again, observe what you did, reflect on it, act. It's a constant developmental loop, focusing on small, simple innovation within the classroom. That's how the fundamental principle of action research. And again, you know, this is the philosophy behind it. It's self-critical and self-critical inquiry by reflective practitioners. Number three is very important. If you're gonna do this, you have to make what you do public. You have to 
to help other people to share your discoveries, to share your resources for in order this to be effective. So it's setting up, you're setting yourself up as a little research center to help enhance the practice of your, of your colleagues, whether it's in the school or the district. Um, so it's very important. And again, when you're making it public, case studies and narratives um, are the best way to do it. The important thing to stress is there is no such thing as failure. There is no such thing as failure in action research. Um, and this, this becomes even more important when, team, when you're doing this in teams. Teams are a great way of doing this, a great way of running action research as a little project in the school. Two or three colleagues working in the same, um, working in the same department or maybe in different departments, but all trying this particular type of innovation. It needs to be in a supportive environment. This is really, really important. So you need to be supportive of each other. And very importantly, you need to get the buy-in and the support of the principal. Because some of this is going to involve, ideally, peer observation. Now, when you talk about observing, you know, sadly, unfortunately, around the world, teach, a lot of teachers are being subjected to highly critical um, critical systems whereby they feel they're like they're under constant scrutiny, uh, constantly being judged. We have to break out of that. And you know the idea that somebody's going to come in and observe your lesson can send, send a lot of teachers into a bit of a panic attack. But this is different. This is not judgmental. This is peer observation of colleagues working together supporting each other in a piece of action research. Okay, you know, what we're gonna do, we're gonna try this. You teach it in your class, I'll sit at the back and I'll watch and I'll see if it works. You know, cause when you're doing it, when you're teaching yourself, you don't, you may not have time for the reflection, the metacognition and the reflection you need, but your friend can do it cause they can watch you, see what worked, see what didn't work, observe things that you might miss. And then you swap it around, you, you modify, they go and do it in their class and you sit and watch their class. Now, there is, this can be tricky in certain cultures, in certain cultures where um, there are shame or face based. I mean, I've, I've taught in an academic environment where observation of each other's lesson was left people feeling a little bit vulnerable and exposed for cultural reasons. Um, so it can take a little bit of work to kind of get past that innate feeling that if you if you comment on my teaching, you're criticizing my teaching, therefore you are criticizing me as a person. It's very important to work at that with sensitivity and again with each other. Agree on a common language, agree on a common language for analysis and critique. So you don't say things like, nah, that's, that was a mistake, didn't work. It's more, you know. That process you did was in, wasn't quite as effective as it could have been because da, 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 da. And again, if you're doing it as a team, you can share resources and you share approaches and you can bounce this off each other. As I said, in terms of reporting um, the results of action research, it's better done as narrative case studies. You know, in my class, in, in my in my class. I did this, I tried to teach set theory using this new technique and this bit worked and this didn't work, but I recommend you have a look at this bit because the kids really responded to it. Um, how Create how-to guides rather than feel the need to imitate an academic style, because to be honest, you know, who reads academic papers other than other academics? Um, and again, together, it's about defining an area for progress, define your criteria for success, plan your activities, plan your observation, and most importantly, share results and resources. So action research is a practical, easy, useful way of conducting research to improve practice in the classroom, as opposed to trying to get academic research um, and kind of fit it into the classroom context where it becomes problematic. So to finish with, here's a little reading list. Um, the first three, these are kind of books 
that introduce the concept of action research, give some ideas about how to run it. Uh, the third one, schools, schools that learn, that's not necessarily about action research per se, but it's about how to develop a culture of self-reflection. Um, and then finally, Bad Science by Ben Goldacre. That is a, it's a, a very clever, uh, entertaining, and quite often quite funny study of how these false theories persist, um, even though they've been refuted. So there's a little reading list. Um,